This video is brought to you by Ground News. What's up, Wisecrack? Socially distanced Jared here. Now, if you're watching this, chances are your life has recently been turned upside down by the novel coronavirus. COVID-19 is currently causing mayhem all over the globe. While biologists, sociologists, all of the ologists really are going to have plenty to say about this whole thing in the coming years, it's impossible to predict the full extent of the virus's impact. All we really know is that the world will most likely look different when this all shakes out. That's because every epidemic or pandemic in history, from the Black Plague to tuberculosis to HIV, has left a sizable mark on humanity. Obviously, there's the tragic death toll, but diseases have also altered, shaped, and reshaped the course of social and political history. Sometimes the connections are very literal. Typhoid is speculated to have knocked out Alexander the Great, the bubonic plague seems to have fast-tracked the downfall of the Byzantine Empire, and measles or smallpox likely did the same to the Roman Empire. But diseases have also kickstarted everything from sexist morality laws to public health infrastructure to rigorous government surveillance. So much so that it's not a stretch to say that diseases created the modern state as we know it. Don't believe us? We've got nothing but time to prove it. So join us on this journey through the nasty microorganisms that have changed human history in this wisecrack edition on how the plague created the modern world. But first, a quick shout out to our sponsor, Ground News. Not unlike diseases, the news cycle has definitely shaped the modern world. Misinformation and hysteria can be as deadly in a pandemic as the disease itself, and it's important to check the facts, health authority guidelines, and vetted information before you decide to loot stores for toilet paper. Between newspapers, cable coverage, and social media, it's become harder and harder to make your own judgment on news stories these days. Luckily, today's sponsor, Ground News, allows you to audit the stories you read online so you can make an informed opinion. The app allows you to view who has covered the same story and where they fall on the political spectrum. You can make your own judgment with less of a fear of being biased. Ground News allows you to follow threads and keep track of all the coverage so you always know what is going on. The app is available on iOS or Android and is free to download. It's a great tool to help you interpret your news, so download it now by clicking the link in the description. And now, back to the show. Today we're going to focus on the bubonic plague because of the unique way it shaped the modern world. Now, don't let the fun name fool you, bubonic plague is a horrifically lethal disease that mostly spreads by a fleas who hang out on rats until they get the chance to jump onto humans and chow down. The plague has swept various countries and even entire continents throughout history, from ancient Byzantium to mid-19th century India to 21st century Madagascar, but we're going to focus on the second plague pandemic known as the Black Death, which began in the mid-14th century. Like your dramatic roommate's troubled relationship, it was on again off again for approximately 500 years, except it also killed up to 50% of Europeans and didn't end in makeup sex on your shared couch. Naturally, the plague generated terror, panic, massive violence, and a surge in religiosity. People desperately fled infected cities under the prevailing wisdom of the time, which held that plague and other maladies were caused by miasma, or the diseased air and all the gnarly smells that haunted city life. Societies were unprepared and physicians were powerless in the face of an ugly as hell disease, often becoming sick themselves. The era's increased urbanization meant more people lived in closer, often unhygienic quarters, which made it all the easier for fleas to jump from rats to humans to spread the disease. Also, increased international trade led to many rat-infested boats transporting spices, textiles, and of course, bubonic plague from country to country. Economies were decimated, social order overthrown, the works. Take Naples, which had nearly half its population wiped out by the plague of 1656. As scholar Frank Snowden writes in his book Epidemics and Society, every activity of normal life ceased amidst shuttered shops, unemployment, and hunger. Snowden depressingly notes that after a while, too few people were left alive to bury all the dead. Throughout Europe, suspected sinners, typically Jews and other religious dissenters, foreigners, accused witches, and sex workers, were banished or even murdered by very scared, very dumb vigilantes. Reeling governmental systems knew they had to act fast. Thus began what Snowden calls the first form of institutionalized public health. In 15th century northern Italian city-states, that meant drafting plague regulations, which anointed new health magistrates who were provided with full legislative, judicial, and executive powers in all matters related to public health. By the 16th century, in some cities, these initially temporary posts had grown into permanent agencies, that is, boards of health. 
These efforts would, according to Snowden, mark a vast extension of state power into spheres of human life that had never been subject to political authority. Such extensions ranged from the regulation of butcher meat to the forced quarantining of entire populations. In Venice, the Office of Health created two lazarettos, or not very mellow islands where ships coming from the eastern Mediterranean were brought to be disembarked and fumigated, again because they thought disease was spread through bad smelling air. Hundreds of less than stoked passengers were then isolated and guarded for 40 days, which would become known as a quarantine after the Italian word for 40. This number incidentally was chosen because in Christian scripture, 40 is associated with purification. Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days before receiving the Ten Commandments, Christ was tempted for 40 days, Christ stayed with his disciples for 40 days after his resurrection, etc. So basically, super solid science stuff. As dumb as this was, it also happened to work, because the incubation period of bubonic plague was shorter than 40 days. Once the practice was found to be apparently effective in quelling the spread in Venice, other European ports followed suit. Of course, there was still the threat of plague being spread by travelers on land, which vigilante groups tried to stem by violently patrolling city walls. This practice eventually became regulated, with troops being deployed to form sanitary cordons, i.e. military barriers that stopped goods and people from entering and forced them into adorable 40-day timeouts. One cordon in Austria was a thousand miles long, required mandatory service of basically all male peasants, and lasted 161 years. As scholar Mitchell Hammond summarizes in his book Epidemics in the Modern World, these kinds of actions became integral to the modern notion of a functioning state that assumed responsibility for the protection of borders and the preservation of health among its citizens. Hammond even argues that concerns about plague began to override concerns about independence among Italian city-states, leading to widespread cooperative efforts to stem the disease. But of course, it wasn't just enough to keep people out. There was also the threat of plague spreading within a city, which is where things get fascinatingly bleak. Sanitary authorities took draconian measures to prevent the disease from spreading. They hired tons of municipal officials to locate plague victims, transport them to lazarettos, and bring corpses to plague burial grounds. Bring out your dead! Bring out your dead! This was an intense process. Picture often drunk searchers and body clearers barging in to ship your seriously ill roommate off to some random island. Plus, in Venice, around two-thirds of Lazaretto patients died, so this was, for all intents and purposes, a likely death sentence. And if you did survive, you'd be charged for the stay. A litany of other rules dotted various cities, including forcing pet owners to kill their beloved fluffy friends, who were seen as potential sources of disease, which is the single saddest fact I have ever learned. Other restrictions ranged from forbidding folks from selling clothes to banning all public gatherings. Sometimes isolation methods were taken, wherein the house of a sick person was marked with a red cross and in England wrote the phrase, Lord have mercy upon us. Then the sick person and their entire household were forced into confinement without any option for medical care and left to die. So salient is the example of plague towns birthing modern power structures that philosopher Michel Foucault called a town under plague an exceptional disciplinary model. In other words, it was like a laboratory for the government's exercise of social control. Citing 17th century French archives, Foucault details the way local governments separated each plague-ridden town into districts, and those districts into quarters, and those quarters into roads, in a new process of segmenting public space. Then there was the literal organization and segmenting of people. Every person in town was required to register themselves in centralized records. Then they had to go get provisions and head into lockup, which meant basically never leaving the house, not even to walk your dog. Long before CCTV or the NSA, Foucault argues that it was here that government surveillance was born. In each town, a road supervisor called a syndic would collect the keys to every house on his block and lock the door from the outside like a prison guard. Syndics would make daily roll calls at each house. They'd call out the name of each inhabitant who, one by one, went to the window to describe their current health condition. It was best to be frank because lying about your fever could get you the death penalty. Least chill of all, breaking quarantine was, and I can't stress this enough, punishable by death. Foucault notes that under these extraordinary circumstances, inspection functions ceaselessly. The gaze is alert everywhere. Stuck within the four walls of your probably shitty 17th century home, every move you made was subject to supervision, a tactic that was entirely unfamiliar. 
Privacy vanished under these conditions as every status update about your health went into the town's permanent records. As Foucault notes, the plague is met by order. Its function is to sort out every possible confusion. In the process, such extreme measures make each individual subject to an omnipresent and omniscient power. Thus, according to Foucault, public health efforts ultimately were born and sustained as a means of controlling urban space and the environment, and expanded political power drastically. Foucault notes that some of the practices employed in plague towns could be related to the way people with leprosy were treated when they were banished to leper colonies. The big difference, though, is rather than persecuting a select unfortunate few, fighting the bubonic plague meant segmenting all of society, which arguably resulted in a much more significant proliferation of power, creating what Foucault called the utopia of the perfect city, with perfect here meaning perfectly controlled. Following these sorts of efforts by the 18th century, plague did essentially disappear from Europe. So draconian laws worked, right? Well, maybe. Snowden notes that these policies were probably only one aspect of what stopped the disease, with other aspects including changes in climate, hygiene, and hypothetically genetic mutations. However, because these laws were typically heralded as the chief cause of Europe's salvation, they have been frequently replicated. Their apparent success has, in more recent pandemics, resulted in governments behaving objectively shitty by forcibly detaining people, surveilling them, and otherwise extinguishing their civil liberties, and no, we don't mean just by closing all the IHOPs. During the third plague wave at the end of the 19th century, colonial Britain attempted to enforce such measures in plague-ridden Bombay with a draconian zeal that it ignored local religious, cultural, and medicinal practices. They divided sick people from their families and burned infected houses to the ground in what Snowden calls public health by eviction and destruction. So brutal was the effort that it caused half the population to flee, thus paradoxically spreading the disease further because, again, traveling flees. Around the same time, over in the States, Chinese Americans were also ordered into quarantine with harsh laws that the courts eventually overturned. So, plagues cause intense laws that, when carried out badly, can seriously infringe on life and liberty. What are we supposed to make of the fact that now many of us are in complete lockdown? First off, just so we're clear, stay the F home. No one is burning down houses yet, in which case we'd probably complain. In times like these, it's also worth considering the fact that the plague didn't simply consolidate government powers and enable abuse. They've also caused some pretty positive changes in society, such as contributing to the lower class uprising in England that eventually ended feudalism, to fostering a nationalist sentiment in India that would eventually lead to the country's independence from colonial control. What's more, the plague's role in strengthening the modern state isn't all bad either, because that state gives you drinkable water, paved roads, and is a pretty big player in the whole not dying of smallpox thing. All that said, it's hard to know what the effect of COVID-19 will be. While bubonic plague is kind of the woodstock of infectious diseases, other epidemics have also catalyzed their fair share of social change. Syphilis, once known as the pox, created huge stigmas around sex work and laws to ban it. Smallpox introduced by Europeans obliterated indigenous populations in the Americas, thwarting any successful resistance to colonization. A smattering of diseases like cholera and typhoid created public health concerns that led to widespread adaptation of indoor plumbing in urban areas. And weirdly enough, tuberculosis, which spread by coughs, provoked fears over hygiene, leading some to speculate that tubercular bacteria could hang out in a dude's beard or mustache. As a result, facial hair tragically disappeared from turn of the century America, for a time at least. What's ultimately so fascinating and also scary about diseases is the unintended ways they change our perceptions of society, health, and even our bodies. While we're plenty grateful for government-run indoor plumbing, it's still pretty weird to realize that much of the way the state gets involved in our day-to-day -day lives stems from the terror and desperation caused by infectious diseases. But what do you think, Wisecrack? Can we blame bubonic plague for all our issues with authority? What legacy should we expect COVID-19 to leave in its wake? And above all, when will I be allowed to leave the house again? Let us know what you think in the comments. Stay safe, healthy, and sane. And before you go, I want to give one last shout out to Ground News for sponsoring this video. Ground News is the first news comparison platform that allows you to see where your news comes from. You can track stories and coverage to stay up to date with everything going on in the world. It's a great tool to help you interpret your news and read coverage across the political spectrum. The app is available on iOS and Android and free to download, so check it out today. Thanks to all our patrons for supporting the channel and our podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace.